Please welcome our final storyteller, Sarah Gray. I was three months pregnant with identical twin boys when my husband Ross and I learned that one of them had a fatal birth defect. Our son Thomas had anencephaly, which means that his skull and brain were not formed properly. And babies with this diagnosis typically die in utero or within minutes, hours, or days of being born. So this diagnosis was devastating and also confusing. I had never heard of this before. It didn't run in my family. And I wondered, uh, was it something I ate? Was it something I drank? Was it something I did? But then, even if it was, why was one of them healthy? So I was wrestling with a lot of questions that would really never have an answer. And I had to um, make peace with that. And um, it was almost like having a, an annoying hum in the background. So six months later, the twins were born, and they were both born alive. Um, Thomas, um, Thomas lived for six days, and Callum was healthy. And Ross and I moved on the best that we could. You know, we had a beautiful, healthy boy to raise. And we decided early on to, um, to tell Callum the truth about his brother. And we have a few pictures of Thomas in our home. And it was um, a, few years, a few years later that it seemed that Callum was starting to comprehend what we were telling him. And sometimes he said things that were uh, sad, and sometimes he said things that were kind of funny. Uh, we visit Thomas's grave a couple times a year, and I remember one time we said to him, um, we're going to bring some flowers to put on Thomas's grave. And Callum um, picked up one of his little matchbox cars and says, I want to put this on, on the grave too, which I thought was really sweet. And then once we were there, uh, Callum said to me, is Thomas scared under there? Of course, I don't really know the answer to that. You know, I can pretend. So I just said to him, no, he's not scared. Um, and then uh, later on, we were sitting on the couch watching cartoons, and Callum said to me, Mommy, what is it like in heaven? Again, I don't really know. Uh, I'll do my best. So I just said, well, um, you know, it's a place. Some people think it's a place you go when you die. Some people don't believe it's, it's there. Uh, and Callum interrupted me, and he said, no, Mommy, look it up on your phone. <laughs> so I was also curious about Thomas's afterlife, but in a totally different way. Um, Ross and I decided to donate Thomas's organs to science. Um, while his death was inevitable, we thought maybe it could be productive. We learned that because he would be too small at birth to donate for transplant, he would be a good candidate to donate for research. So we were able to donate four things, uh, his liver, his cord blood, his cornea, which is the front of the eye, and his retina, which is the back of the eye. Um, and I was curious as to if these donations really made a difference. So later on, I was on a business trip in Boston, and I remembered that Thomas's corneas went to a division of Harvard Medical School called the Scapin's Eye Research Institute. And I, I took some advice from Callum, and I looked it up on my phone. <laughs> and I saw that it was only a few miles from my hotel. And I thought to myself, I would love to visit this lab and learn more about where this donation went. Um, because I, um, I gave them a donation, but it wasn't just signing a check or giving a bag of clothes. You know, I gave them a gift of my child. 
At the same time, um, I signed the informed consent forms that state that I know that um, once I make this donation, I'm not going to get any more information about it. And I signed them anyway. I did that fully informed. So if they did not welcome me, I would understand where they were coming from. But I really thought, I think I have the right to visit this place anyway. I, I thought, you know, if they reject me, am I really emotionally ready for that? Um, and what's that going to do to my grief if they reject me? But I called. And I explained to the receptionist, I said, um, I donated my son's eyes to your lab a few years ago. I'm in town for a couple of days. Is there any chance I can stop by for a 10-minute tour? And there was a long pause. And lucky for me, the receptionist was very compassionate. and She didn't laugh or say it was weird, which, which it is a little weird. Uh, she said, I've never had this request before. I don't know who to transfer you to. But don't hang up, because I'm going to find somebody for you. Um, but don't hang up. So she connected me to someone in donor relations, which it was not organ donor relations. <laughs> it was financial donor relations. But she knew how to give a tour. So we set up an appointment, and the next day I showed up, and she introduced me to one of the people who requests corneas, Dr. James Ziske. He's a professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. And I stood in his doorway. She um, explained who I was. And he was eating a whole foods salad at his desk. <laughs> and he stood up, and he thanked me for the donation, and he shook my hand. And he said, do you have any questions for me? And I was so emotional meeting him. Um, I said, how many corneas do you request in a year? And he said, my lab requests about 10 a year. We would request more, um, but they're hard to get. And infant eyes are like gold to us. And my heart was just in my throat, and I could barely like choke out the words, and I said, could you tell me why? And he said, well, infant eyes, um, first of all, they're unusual, because most of us are older when we die, and that's when you donate your eyes. But also, infant eyes have the potential to regenerate in the lab. And if you don't mind me asking, how long ago did your son die? And I said, about two years ago. And he said, we're likely still uh, studying your son's eye cells right now, and they're probably in this lab right now. So after the tour concluded, um, my tour guide said to me, um, she said, I'll never forget you, and please keep in touch with me. And I felt something in me started to change. And I felt that my son had found his place in the world. And that place was Harvard. So my son got into Harvard, <laughs> and I'm now an Ivy League mom. <laughs> but I also sort of got the bug, and I thought, you know, maybe I could visit these three other places, too. And, you know, would they be as nice to me as the Harvard people were? And I sort of surprised myself, because I just uh, made some phone calls, and it was easier to set up than I thought. But this, uh, so I set up two appointments, both in Durham, North Carolina, and this time I took my husband and our son. So our next visit was at Duke University at the Center for Human Genetics, where the cord blood went. And we met the director of the center, who was also working on, who had also worked on the Human Genome Project. And he explained that the twins' blood was extremely valuable to them. He said he's studying a field called epigenetics. Um, so while the twins' blood, uh, the twins' genes were the same because they were identical twins, there's a field called epigenetics that explains why um, genes turn themselves on and off. So even though they're identical, these twins could be different. And this blood helped them to establish a baseline. 
they also um, analyzed the blood and produced a poster for a conference, and they gave us a copy. We then drove down the street to Cytonet, which is the place that got Thomas's liver. And we met the president and about eight members of staff, and we even met the woman who held Thomas's liver in her hands. They also um, explained to us that Thomas's liver was used in a six liver study to determine the um, best temperature to freeze infant liver cells for a life-saving therapy. And they also said that we were the only donor family that had ever visited before. A few years later, I set up the final appointment in Philadelphia, and Ross Kalm and I went to the University of Pennsylvania. That's where we met the researcher that got Thomas's retinas. And she explained that she was studying retinoblastoma, which is a deadly cancer of the retina. And she said that she had been waiting six years for a sample like Thomas's. And it was so precious to her that she had saved some of it. And five years later, she still had some in her freezer. And did we want to see it? Yes, we did. <laughs> she then uh, she gave Callum a, a pen t-shirt. And she offered him an internship. So I had thought when we made this donation that in the abstract and in a generic sense that this is a nice thing to do. But I was really amazed and blown away when I met the researchers and they told me specifically what they were doing with each donation. And I had this, the feeling of grief that I had started to turn into pride and I felt that Callum, or that Thomas was um, introducing us to his colleagues and his co-workers. Um, and he was introducing me to people I, I never would have met, and even taking me to places that I never would have been, in including here tonight. And that humming that I felt in the back of my mind uh, stopped. Uh, recently, Ross Kalman and I went to Philadelphia to accept an award from the National Disease Research Interchange for advocacy. And we went on stage, and Kalman accepted this award. And I took the opportunity, he was so proud, I, I took the opportunity to ask him a question. And I said, do you know why we're accepting this award? And he said, um, for helping people. So I know that as he grows older, there will be more questions, tough questions. And I'm going to have to teach him that sometimes in life there are questions that um, are important, but you'll still never get the answer. Um, but it's always worth a try, and you never know until you ask. Thank you. <laughs>